So uh, when Pastor Jason asked me to come preach this week, I said, well, what do you want me to preach about? And he's like, well, we're doing this great series about the Holy Spirit with all these words that start with C. And I'm like, okay, great. Uh, what scripture do you want me to use? I don't care. Use what you want. Uh, so I hope that this is fitting in with everything that you all have been talking about. And I'm really, really excited. I always love every time I'm preparing for a sermon, how God illuminates things for me during that week. And man, have I experienced the Holy Spirit this week. And a little bit later, I'm going to tell you about a really special moment I encountered this week and invite you in on that experience as well. But let's just review where you've been. So you started talking about how the Holy Spirit is active in congregation, right? God calls us into community to be together, to experience him and remember his promises. You talked about how the Holy Spirit is active in creation. Uh, even though we hear about the Holy Spirit later in scripture, when you read backwards all the way back to Genesis, you see that it was already there, right? The beauty of scripture. Then a couple of weeks ago, I was here on a really special day where we talked about the Holy Spirit being active in confirmation. And we had those amazing young men and women stand up here and profess their faith and how the Holy Spirit is working in their lives. Last week, Jason talked to you about the Holy Spirit is active in uh, cohabitation. He talked to you about the tabernacle and lots of great things. And so today, the C word that I have is coronation. So I want you just to think about that word for a minute, coronation. What comes to mind to you when you hear that word? Well, what comes to mind for me instantly was kings and queens, right? Coronation. So just a little over a month ago, not even maybe a month, at the beginning of this month, we saw uh, England celebrate the coronation of a new king and queen. So on the, at the screen up here, there's a picture of that day. King Charles III and Queen Camilla, along with the previously reigning queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth, who was King Charles's mother. Interesting fact, she was coronated on June 2nd of 1953, and she accepted that call to the throne when she was only 25 years old from her father. I don't know, when I read that, I thought, I can't imagine at 25 taking over as the queen of England, right? That had to have been intimidating, right? Did any of you get up super early and watch any of the coronation? It was on for hours on TV. Uh, I didn't know if we had any people that love that kind of royalty, right? I will admit I got to see part of it only because when you have kids that are involved in sports, you never sleep in on Saturday mornings, right? Um, so I was able to see part of the church service, and it was a day full of beauty. There was amazing liturgy that I think all of us could have sat and been like, wow. This is awesome. They had beautiful prayers, sang hymns that would be familiar to all of us, and it was majesty, majesty to its finest. Nothing like I'd ever seen. So I brought some props with me today because I just thought it would be fun. So I thought, as I was preparing for this, a really important thing we could think about would be what a king or queen wears, right? Like many of you, this is not super fancy. Sorry, this is what I could come up with. But we have this fancy crown, right? You definitely see this fancy, fancy crown, right, on this king. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what that word coronation even means. It's a crowning of a sovereign or a sovereign's co consort. So this is something that's kind of foreign to us. We don't think about kings and queens here in the United States. But I think we probably should. And I don't think this is the image that we should have in mind when we hear the word coronation. I think this is the image we should have in our head when we think of the word coronation. Jesus didn't get a fancy crown. He got a crown of thorns, right? This was his majesty's crowning. Not at all like what I saw on TV. It was not the beauty of jewels and gold it was him being mocked as king of the Jews and wearing what had to have been an immensely painful crown of thorns. So today we're going to dig in to our king, King Jesus, and how his coronation gives us the Holy Spirit and invites us into a kingdom that already exists. Before we get there, though, I want to go back one more time to King Charles. So this, if you watched was the carriage that took him from the church to the next events. So just take a look at this. Pretty 
amazing, right? I see lots of gold. I see very formal looking guards, right, that are dressed uh, in their fanciest clothes. I don't see any real people around. They were probably lining the streets to get a glimpse, right? But this is how King Charles was kind of acknowledged as king. But again, this isn't the image I think we should have. I think it should be this image. Because here's King Jesus on Palm Sunday when he rode in, not on a gold carriage, not on even a fancy horse, but on a very humble donkey. And so this is where I want us to start when we dig into God's word today. So we're going to go into the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 37 and 38. And it says this. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So what does this mean to us today? What does it really mean to make Jesus the king and Lord of our lives? So a person who says Jesus is Lord has a full understanding of what this means. I apologize, that's pretty small. I'm going to read to you what it says. It says Jesus is God and has supreme authority over all things and that Jesus has been given this title of Lord and King by God the Father. And made me think of the verse from Matthew 28, 18, where it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So in the New Testament, the word Lord is the most frequently used title for Jesus Christ. Although we rarely use this term in our daily lives, we are all quite familiar with another word that we probably do use. That's the word boss. That's basically what Lord means. One who possesses the authority and power and control. The word God described Jesus at the head of the church, the ruler of all creation, and the Lord of lords, and the king of kings. This references of Jesus as Lord was what Thomas declared when Jesus arrived with the apostles after his resurrection. Thomas said to them, my Lord and my God. From thereafter, the message of the apostles was that Jesus was Lord, signifying that Jesus really was God. So if we can own what this means, that Jesus is King and Lord of our life, the next thing I think we need to think about is why is it even important for us to think that Jesus is Lord and King of our lives? The first really big one is that the kingdom is now. It doesn't start when we get to heaven. It's right now. God is on the throne. As we sit here at Word of Life, God is on the throne, right? It means that we have a king ruling and reigning over us. He's immovable, he's not replaceable, and he has an immense amount of glory and honor associated with him. And we can rest in the fact that we have a king that will never leave us alone despite what we might be tempted to think or what the world might try to tell us. This world does have order and it does have meaning and everything that we encounter matters, even if we're enduring something hard. The realm of Christ's reign covers everything that happens in heaven and right here on earth. No one, not even those who deny his existence, can be free of his rule. They're not outside of the sphere of his authority over our lives. And even though the enemy would like to tempt us or to convince us that liberty is only found when we get what we want, true freedom is really found when we submit to Christ's loving lordship over our lives. Everything really is going God's way, which means nothing is a surprise to our king and nothing is outside of his control. Now, some of you might be wondering, because maybe right now in life, you're feeling a lot of suffering or pain or anxiety or doubt. But the one thing we know that all of this is going to be used by our king for restoration, for redemption, and that we can trust that he has a hand in it because his heart is for us. His heart is of love. And that even death cannot release us from the authority of God. He is the Lord of both the living and the dead. All people must decide to either yield or rebel against him. But they have the opportunity to make the choice. And it's, we make this choice while we're living. 
After a death, we will all be able to acknowledge as Christ's lordship and have accountability to him. Our hope is that we've all bowed a knee before our king in the kingdom that is now. So if we know what it means to have Jesus as Lord of our life, and why is it important? Then the next important thing to think about is, well, what do we do with all that? What's next? And this is where it gets hard, because it means we have to give up control. Anybody in here a planner? Anybody like to have a little bit of control? Okay, this is church, you can't lie. You should all be raising your hand a little bit, right? Because all of us want to have some sense of knowing what's coming next or to be able to stop something that we don't want to have happen, right? But when we really, really are obedient to this call of serving in this kingdom where we have a Lord that reigns right now, it means that we're giving up control, that it's Jesus, not us, who decide where we're going to go. It's Jesus, not us, who decides the person that we're going to be. It's Jesus, not us, who decides on our salvation. He's already paid the price. He just wants us to follow with love. Remember those two great commandments, love God, love others. That's what he's asking us to obey. So there's these two parts to being a Christian. First, we have to accept that Jesus is our Savior. And then comes the second, more difficult part, where we have to give up control and own the fact that Jesus is Lord and King in our lives. He's the undisputed boss. He's got full control and he has a good plan even when we don't feel like it. Submitting to Jesus' lordship means we obey him, and we live our lives knowing that he wants good for us, and he leads us in true joy. When Jesus tells us to love others as we love ourselves, he means it. He wants us to care just as much about our enemy's well-being as we do our kids or our spouse or our family or ourselves. These are some ways we get to acknowledge and submit to his lordship. By doing those things God commands us, we can tr truly show him that we are yielding to him and allowing him to be king in our lives. And he gives us this grace and mercy all the time so that we can give it to others, so we can invite others into the kingdom with us. So now that we've kind of established Jesus is king, and that what we need to have for him to be Lord of our lives and all those things, now comes this other part. Where does the Holy Spirit fit into all this? So I'm about ready to say something that at first hearing, you're probably going to think I'm crazy. But I want you to roll with me for a minute. Because I heard this phrase in a Bible study I'm doing with a great pastor named Tony Evans. And it was something he said about Jesus and the Holy Spirit that I had never thought of before and I haven't been able to get it out of my mind. And I know I heard it when I did, so I could share it today as we talked about the Holy Spirit. When we think about Jesus' rule as king, the first thing we need to think about is that it's better that Jesus isn't here. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but when we think about it, his kingly sacrifice to leave this world and give up his reign here is the reason we have the Holy Spirit. Right? He left and said he was sending something better to stay with us. And when you think about that, when Jesus walked this earth, he was fully human, which meant he had the limitations of the body like we do. Jesus only traveled a total of 300 miles in his ministry. When we think about 300 miles, that's not very far. But because he gives us the Holy Spirit, he is in us and around us all the time, all people for all places for all time. That wouldn't be the case if Jesus were still here. We have a king who knew it was better for us that he didn't stay. He knew we needed his lordship to reign over us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And like I said, that Holy Spirit works in two ways. It works within us to guide us, to protect us from those enemy attacks of our hearts and our minds. I say to people all the time when they tell me things that they're thinking in their head, I'm like, if that doesn't sound like God... It's not God, right? God doesn't make junk. He makes masterpieces. And so when you hear anything that is other than a masterpiece kind of conversation in your head, that's the enemy. And you need to ask that Holy Spirit to push that away. So we have him working in and through us, but we also have him working around us to protect us and lead us and guide us. It's pretty cool when you think about how powerful that is. 
Jesus in human form couldn't have done that for us. He would have had those limitations. But with the Holy Spirit, his potential to reign over us is limitless. And we couldn't obey these commands to God on our own. It's not possible for us to say we're going to obey everything God tells us to do and do it on our own. Remember that control piece again? We want to think we can, but the Holy Spirit it, is what makes it possible for us to submit to his lordship. And a person becomes a believer by acknowledging Jesus as their Lord and submitting to him. I love the words that John's gospel shares where Jesus tells us about this gift of the Holy Spirit. It comes in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 25 through 31, and it says this. At this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. It's this beautiful image of what he's inviting us to do. He knew he needed help. We need the help. He gave us peace. That's what he wants. In the midst of our suffering, in the midst of hard times, he says, don't be afraid. I'm leaving behind the Spirit to be with you. So now that we've traveled this way through why it's important to see Jesus as Lord and how the Holy Spirit is very present and active because of that, the last place we need to end on here is what's our response? What do we do? Well, there's a few things I think we really need to do. We need to live the kingdom that's available to us right now. We are invited into the most beautiful kingdom in the world with the most precious, loving, grace-filled, mercy-giving king that there ever could be and it's already started. We can own this royalty in our life. We need to be ready to bow at his feet. And what that looks like is being obedient and loving others and ourselves. And I put up here, be like popcorn. Again, roll with me here. I know this sounds crazy. Uh, but I want you to picture a popcorn kernel right now. It's not much to look at, wouldn't want to eat it, doesn't smell good, doesn't taste good. But we know there's something pretty amazing on the inside, right? And when it has the right environment with the right kind of care, it bursts and it's sweet and beautiful and great on the inside. And I think this is a great analogy to think about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Within us to give us what we need to really pop and shine and on the external to give us what we need to make that happen. So I want to share with you two examples uh, from my life about how the, Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit has allowed me to see this popcorn action. So I told you earlier when I started about how it's really amazing how when you're studying the word or uh, getting ready to do something, how God brings things to light to you, whether it's songs or Facebook posts or in my devotions. Well, this last week, I got to start off my Wednesday in one of the most beautiful, amazing ways I could have ever imagined. I was invited with a family from the church I serve at up in Cedar Rapids to go and watch as they adopted their son. So uh, I'm going to try to do this without crying because it was one of the most beautiful moments I've ever seen. This family is an amazing young couple. They have two young sons. Both are in preschool. They got involved in church a few years ago by coming on Wednesday nights to love on middle school kids. And while their two boys went to the nursery, it really sparked in them that they wanted to do foster care. So they made the decision uh, to do foster care. And so they took some kids in uh, and they took in uh, this young man who's a seventh grader. And so for the last seven and a half months, they've fostered him. It's the longest he's been with a family his entire life. Uh, he's had all things stacked against him. I remember the first time they brought him into church, he didn't want to be there. He'd been hurt by other fast foster families forcing Jesus down his throat, not telling him about the beauty of a relationship with Jesus. 
And so we've watched this young man come on Wednesday night every year, every week this year, uh, to the point where a few weeks ago we had a student serve Sunday, and he got up in front of our modern worship service of 400 students and played his trombone in the band and helped lead us in worship. It's been a beautiful thing, and as I sat watching his new mom and dad sit there to adopt him and his two new younger <laughs> brothers, I saw him pop. He had the right environment, the right things to allow his shell to be broken and allow himself to be adopted and have a forever family. And it was really cool for all of us to get to see that and to see how the judge asked questions of his siblings and invited them into this experience. We got to see Jesus move and reign in that family's life and to think about how that will ripple around the people in them. So I think that's a great example of how the Holy Spirit works externally to allow us to see him, sometimes not in our own life, but by watching others. The other time is a, a, probably the very first time in my life that I felt like something happened to me where it was the Holy Spirit's prompting. Uh, I've grown up in the Lutheran church my whole life, right? My mom was my Sunday school teacher. I don't ever really remember learning about the Holy Spirit in a deep, intense way until I started seminary. And one of the things that we get to do, we get to do, I say that because it's my least favorite thing in the world to do, is go on a silent retreat. Some of you know this, I'm not a silent person. <laughs> At any point in my life, I have I been silent. And so we were invited to go 48 hours silent to experience the Lord. And I was terrified. I knew I had to get a place where there would be no one around. So I rented a cabin off on a farm field, had no running water, no electricity, I don't know why I thought I could do this. I'm not a camper. My husband and son are. But I was going to do this and I was going to survive. And I remember the first night there thinking, this feels like torture. This is not how I experience God. This is not how, I'm not going to experience God here. I was so convinced that this was just going to be punishment for me. Like, because I talk too much, God has a funny sense of humor. <laughs> He's going to make me be quiet. But uh, I decided to embrace it, to be obedient and to work through it. And so the first morning I woke up there after surviving the night, uh, I was sitting out on the front porch and I was praying. And all of a sudden I felt this sense that I needed to really be honest with myself and admit that I was hurting. Admit that there were some times I didn't feel God. Admit that I didn't know if being a pastor was what I was really supposed to do. Uh, admit to myself that I'd made big mistakes in my life that I still felt guilt and shame over. And I decided I had to use this opportunity to get real, to be obedient, to submit, and to trust when I've given something to the Lord, I don't have to keep picking it back up, right? When we're invited to communion in a little bit, we're invited to lay it all down, but so often we pick it back up and keep worrying, right? That should be stamped on my forehead, worrier. I just kept doing it, right? Kept thinking, maybe I need to apologize again. I need to ask for forgiveness again. And so I went for a walk, and I walked for five miles before I got back having this conversation out loud with the Lord. Walking, walking, just saying everything. Like, this time I mean it. I'm giving it to you. I'm not going to pick it back up, all this. And when I got back to this little farmhouse, I sat out in the field, and I said, God, I need you to wash this away. I need you to wash it away. I need it to be done. And a beautiful morning like today, full of sunshine, after I got, got done saying that prayer for two minutes, it poured, absolutely poured. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit shook me in a way that I burst like popcorn. And from that moment on, I was assured in my call to be a pastor. I was assured that he had forgiven me for all those things I thought I would never really, really be forgiven for. And I saw how he works when you're obedient and when you stop to listen. So both of these examples are displays of the Holy Spirit bursting through our shells to see the richness and beauty of what our King does for us in his kingdom. Friends, the Holy Spirit is active in coronation, and we have a King who gladly wore this and paid our debt so we never had to pick it up again, and so that we could live in the freedom of this kingdom that starts today and goes on forever when we know who our Lord is. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you that you are a God who reigns. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you take us exactly where we're at and you don't leave us there. You invite us into this beautiful kingdom where you don't promise it to be easy, but you promise that you'll be with us. 
that when we feel immense suffering and pain, at the same time, there's this beauty of joy and hope that you give us. So God, help us to rest in the fact that you left, but you gave us such a gift, and it dwells within us and around us. And you are just inviting us to use this gift of the Holy Spirit to live out our royalty as serving under you as our king. So God, help us to look for ways we can own this invitation in our lives, that we can give it to others, and we can rest in the fact that you are a king that will never be replaced or need to be replaced because you are with us now and for all the ages to come. We thank you, God, that you sent your son, Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you that you died to pay it all, that you win over death and that you reign. Help us to live in that royalty. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.